This guy is called Donald Sadaway, and I'm guessing that's a name that many of you are already very familiar with. Donald is a materials chemistry professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. And for about a decade now, he and his team have been developing a technology that he's always claimed will revolutionize energy storage. It's called a liquid metal battery, and Professor Sadaway is certainly not shy about extolling its virtues. He reckons it's a zero maintenance, virtually zero degradation, high temperature chemistry that can outperform lithium ion batteries on cost and performance. The only slight snag is, it hasn't, at least not yet anyway. Despite a $35 million cash injection in 2014 from investors including Bill Gates and Total, Sadaway's startup company, Ambry, struggled to reach its lofty goals, with disappointing results in 2016 leading to the laying off of a quarter of the team. But Sadaway has shown himself to be an extremely dogged and persistent innovator, and he's refused to give up on his quest, keeping the company going and pushing development as hard as possible in the four years between then and now. And that determination and drive might just be about to pay off, because in November 2020, Ambry struck its first major commercial deal to supply a 250 megawatt hour liquid metal battery storage system to a huge data center due to start construction in Reno, Nevada in 2021. Now the tried and tested safe bet for TerraScale, who were the company running the construction project, would have been to use utility scale lithium ion batteries, but instead they've chosen to take a pretty big financial risk on a technology that has so far not been proven in a commercial environment. So what is it that TerraScale have seen in Sadaway's invention that's convinced them to take the plunge? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. In October 2020, the International Energy Agency published its World Energy Outlook report, which states that global greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced by 40% in the next nine years if the world is to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. We're miles off that, of course, not even close. 2020 was a bit of an aberration for obvious reasons, but once everyone's had a couple of doses of vaccine, no doubt we'll all feel invincible again and much of society will return to its pre-pandemic high consumption habits. Meanwhile, in the background, a Herculean effort is being undertaken by grid operators all over the world to integrate low or zero carbon technologies onto their systems as quickly as possible in an effort to meet the challenge. Bloomberg New Energy Finance projects that by 2050, solar and wind will be producing 56% of all power consumed globally, with hydro and nuclear providing a further 21%, and the remaining gas-fired power plants and tiny number of coal plants, assuming they even exist at all by then, will be smothered in expensive carbon capture and storage systems. To enable that volume of renewable energy to actually keep the lights on around the clock, 365 days a year, we're going to need a level of grid scale energy storage that makes our current provision look like a couple of AA batteries in the back of a radio. And that's why we've been discovering and explaining so many different energy storage technologies on this channel over the last couple of years. We'll probably need all of them and then some. Right now though, the dominant technology is of course lithium ion batteries. They're doing a pretty decent job and by dint of sheer economy of scale, they are the cheapest option currently available. They've got pretty good energy density and can respond to frequency fluctuations on the grid within milliseconds. But they were never designed for very large utility scale implementation. They're much better suited for use as single cells for laptops and phones. Once you start connecting them together in bulk, they have to be quite carefully monitored and managed to keep voltages balanced across the cells and to keep temperatures down to safe working levels. And because the electrodes are made of solid material, they suffer tiny amounts of damage each time they get hit by lithium ions during the charge and discharge phases. And that damage is permanent and it accumulates over time, which leads to battery degradation. And then there's the dreaded dendrites. You've probably heard about them. Essentially, they're a buildup of lithium deposits on the anode, which grow into long thin filaments that can eventually travel across the electrolyte separator and reach the cathode on the other side, causing a fairly dramatic short circuit. Professor Sadaway reckons he's got the answer to all these drawbacks with his liquid metal chemistry. Not many metals are liquid at normal working temperatures, and the metals in Ambry's system are no exception. 
Now you might think, given our experience of what can happen to a lithium ion battery at very high temperatures, that deliberately heating up your anode and cathode towards their melting point is an extremely bad idea indeed. But Sadaway didn't start with lithium ion batteries. He started with a nice crisp piece of blank paper on which he sketched out a fundamentally different way of constructing an electrochemical energy storage device. Admittedly, there has been a massive amount of experimentation over the years to get the optimal choice of materials, but the basic principle has never changed, and it's this. The solid antimony and calcium alloy are combined at room temperature with a solid electrolyte and put inside a sealed chamber insulated with a ceramic material. Think of it a bit like a mini kiln. The whole thing is encased in a positively polarised case with a negative terminal sticking out the top. At room temperature, you've got nothing more than an extremely heavy inanimate object. In their solid states, it's impossible for the internal elements to react with each other to generate electricity. And that means the batteries are completely safe for transport. Once they're in situ and set up though, an electrical current heats them up to 500 degrees Celsius, which causes the metals and the salt electrolyte to move to a molten state. And then gravity takes over, separating them out according to their density. The antimony sinks, the molten salt stays in the middle and the calcium alloy rises to the top. At this stage, the battery is charged and ready to go. Antimony and calcium exist at opposite ends of the periodic table, and for reasons that are outside the scope of this video, antimony is more electronegative than calcium, which means there's a potential difference between them. So when a device is placed in the circuit, the calcium alloy breaks down into calcium ions and electrons. The ions are attracted down to the antimony, and the electrons get there by flowing through the external circuit. So you may be thinking, that's just a very hot version of a standard battery. But discharging this system results in a completely new alloy of antimony and calcium with the molten electrolytes sitting on top. And because it's a liquid, there's no permanent deformation or damage as the calcium ions hit the antimony. And dendrites aren't a thing either because there's no solid surface for anything to build up on. To recharge the system, you simply use the electrical current from your renewable power sources to reverse the reaction, which causes the calcium alloy and the antimony to reform to their original positions. After the initial input of electricity, the reaction generates its own heat, keeping the battery at optimum working temperature and eliminating the need for an external heat source. Sadoway argues that the beauty of the system is in its simplicity. He points out that unlike lithium ion batteries, these things actually like to be worked hard, ideally being fully charged and discharged every couple of days to maintain their constant high temperature. His team's research analysis showed an overall end-to-end -end efficiency of 80%, which is higher than pumped hydro. And Sadaway says operators can expect tens of thousands of cycles with negligible degradation or capacity fade. And because they have a self-maintaining temperature, the batteries will work just as safely and effectively in very cold climates like the Arctic or very hot climates like, for example, India, where there's an urgent focus on getting renewables onto the grid as quickly as possible. If for some reason the battery gets tipped over, causing a short circuit between the metals, then you will get a pretty big spike in temperature, but still well within the insulating capacity of the ceramic enclosure. After that, the reaction simply stops and the whole thing cools back down to the inanimate lump you started with. No dramatic fires or explosions like the ones we occasionally hear about with lithium iron. And you're still left with a functional battery too. Just stick a current through it again and the metals dutifully separate back out into their charged up positions, ready to go again. The biggest challenge that Ambry faces is the economy of scale hurdle that all technologies face when they first get going. But according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the cost of the electrode materials for Ambry's battery are only about a third of the cost of the electrode materials in a lithium ion battery. And the kickstart to scale production that Ambry so desperately needs may well come in the form of that deal with TerraScale that I mentioned right at the start of the program. The project is called Energos Reno. It's a 3,700 acre site which will have its own microgrid comprising 500 megawatts of renewable capacity, powering a massive data center that will likely be used by commercial clients and government agencies. If Ambry's 250 megawatt hour installation does what it says on the tin, 
then Professor Sadoway may finally see the floodgates open for the technology he's dedicated himself to for more than a decade, and history may come to record his contribution to energy storage on a similar level to John B. Goodenough's revolutionary lithium-ion breakthrough several decades earlier. Judging by the large number of people who asked me to take a look at this technology for the channel, I'm quite sure there'll be some strong opinions on liquid metal batteries and the trajectory of energy storage in general. So jump down to the comments section below and leave your thoughts there. That's it for this week though. Thanks to our fantastic Patreon supporters who help keep the channel independent and keep these videos ad free. And a quick shout out to the folks who've joined since last time with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are David Fain, Jonathan Jarvis, Marcel Ward, Alexander Siraz, Rob van der Vau, Ryan Milakovic, Amy Hemeter, Mark Green, Colin Meyer, John Comstock and Colin Cochran. And of course a big thank you to everyone else who's joined since last time too. You can support the channel and receive exclusive news updates from me plus the chance to select future video topics in monthly content polls by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And of course you can hugely support the channel absolutely for free by subscribing and hitting that like button. And if you want to be notified about new content each week, make sure you hit that little bell icon too. Dead easy to subscribe, you just need to click down there or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching, have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.